Good morning, everybody. Are we good to get started? Yeah, everyone have a cup of coffee and a little breakfast? Wow, this is phenomenal. Welcome to Dominion Payroll's 15th year end seminar. That is so cool. I can't believe we're even saying that. That is, um, that is really strange. Um, I, I love our year end seminar, even though we talk about things like tax and healthcare. Um, <laughs> it, it really is for me um, a chance every year to kind of just sit back and say, okay, what do I say to our clients and our community partners about what, what have we done? You know, what have we done to improve our service or innovate our products and, um, or, or done something to help you? And yesterday, as I was driving around thinking about that, I thought, man, I, I feel like we haven't done anything. I really, I, you know, I was like, oh, you know, in 2016, we had a big acquisition in Nashville, and we had a big growth year, and we'd rolled out our, our benefit administration department, and I was kind of at this loss of, like, did, did we not do anything in 2017? And I thought, we moved. I, I, it had totally blanked that Dave and I, um, for three years, have been planning kind of this moment right here, right? And, um, and that was the launch of our headquarters right here in, in Scott's edition. And um, this was, hands down for Dave and I, the most intensive, overwhelming project that any business owners could have possibly been in. And we wouldn't have done it any other way. And everything that was painful was absolutely worth it. And it may have been the greatest pivot of our history. And I'm really proud of this moment. Um, for, for much more than just our new location or where we are or why we are here. Um, and, and that really is, to me, the room that you're in. And when Dave and I, um, all of you had been at our old building, which was 306 East Main Street, which when we moved into that 11 years ago, we thought that was the coolest space in all of Richmond, which it still is a great space. It's a beautiful building. It's just really interesting. Um, but it lacked some fundamental components as we grew and we understood more about our business that it, it didn't allow for us to have community gather or collection. It didn't allow for us to bring our employees together, to, to be silent for a minute, to be creative together, to innovate together, or to, to, to discuss and change things. Um, and it certainly didn't lend itself to bring our clients in and train them or educate them, or, or be friends with them, or innovate with them. And so when we went out and kind of into the space and said, okay, we need to move. Our business is on a significant growth trajectory. We were going to be change agents in our industry. That was a decision that he and I made. Okay, well, we need to build the space around that concept. Okay, we need, to, we need to begin with what is the most important part of our design, and that is this room. Okay, and this approximate 2,000 square feet, all of our architects and our construction engineers said, oh, you need to fill it up with offices and you could do all these. And we said, no, 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 no. It needs to be open and it needs to be available and it needs to be modular so that we can bring our clients in in the morning and we can have a community board function in the afternoon and we could host a book signing party in the night. Okay, that this is a place that our community can come in and engage in thought leadership and creativity and innovation. And if we do that, we will be the greatest payroll services company in the nation. Okay? That was what really drove everything. So from this pivot point all the way back for the 20,000 square feet, everything else was filler to this design. Okay? And for years, you guys have all come to our client seminars. You guys have all been there. We've done them at... Uh, Richmond Center stage and the food bank and the diamond and we did one at the bird theater and the children's museum and we did it at the Richmond ballet one year when they did a performance we've tried to highlight great community spaces because to us we said hey look we're a payroll organization of the community that includes great nonprofits like the chamber who held their impact awards last night congratulations on pulling that off and congratulations on it being over I know what it's like to be involved in that and congratulations to a winner the Ronick family from Fahrenheit Technologies, I should call you, I don't know if we have any other winners in here, I'm sure we do, I know our client base is full of that, 
Um, but congratulations. And, and just on a side note, that's a business that started right with Dominion Payroll. Um, arm in arm, uh, maybe what, 12, 15 years ago, however long it was, and we've just been together. So congratulations. We feel like we're part winner in that too. So congrats. I know your husband's back at work, Heather, uh, trying to win it again. Next year, I'm going to edge him out there. You, you can be sure on that. All right. Um, so anyway, um, th th this space was, was all designed with that concept. Dave and I and our staff, we, we, you, you all know we have offices in some really, really great cities. Okay. And people always said, it was, oh, isn't it? You know, how did you pick Austin or how did you pick Nashville or Tampa or, um, or Charlotte? And you say, well, wouldn't you go there too? Right. You know, you know why, would, why wouldn't you be doing business in a city or a community that is changing the way we see things, right? That is changing the way we do business or changing the way we attack um, social challenges or embracing our younger generation and our millennial talent and the, the phenomenal workforce that is coming up that we don't understand. And those cities are doing that every day. They're doing that every day. And when you go there and you think, oh my gosh, this place is amazing, right? And you look a little bit deeper into why they're amazing. They are not awesome because they have, you know, the best opera or the best symphony or the best honky tonk on Broadway. They are awesome because the community engages in real social change. That's what is happening in those amazing cities. I'm telling you that the underlying thread of those communities is about something more than just great country music or really cool rock and roll or awesome art or a cool beach, okay? Their entrepreneurs are engaging with the best artist. You guys are gonna get to meet a great friend of mine who's gonna talk for a minute, okay? And they're, they're getting together and they're doing cool projects. And the artists are inspiring the business people to do really cool things, right? And the business people are challenging the artists to do things that will collectively make us better. Think differently about the way we are solving our problems. Think differently about the way we are doing business. Constantly forcing us to look at those, those challenges that we all deal with on a, on a different level, okay? And um, I'm really proud of Dominion Payroll because I, I really believe that every day we come into this building and say, hey, we, we have got to bring those concepts to this community. Richmond has all of those amazing qualities. We have the beautiful terrain, the topography. We have the millennial generation. We have one of the great universities in America right across the street, right? We have the best nonprofits. Um, one of our beloved nonprofits is the Cameron Gallagher Foundation. My wife is here somewhere. She's a client. And she also opened up um, a speech to unveil the brand new Virginia Treatment Center for Children two nights ago. The ribbon cutting is tomorrow, okay? And, and they did that. They opened that new hospital because organizations like you and me, right, said, hey, there's an important social change here that needs to happen. And we got together and we raised funds and we changed stigma and now they have a new hospital, okay? Um, it's a long way to describe to you how the evolution of Dominion Payroll Services got to this physical asset here, right? It's the way we tech business. And I, I, I truly believe that now my role here with you isn't necessarily to come and welcome you and, and start talking about tax, but maybe come to you as a community agitator and say, hey, uh, do this too, right? Take this back to your businesses and, and um, take a nugget of, of, of this because this is happening all across America. And if you're not doing this, you, you need to because it's the world we live in now. And in order for us to be great as a community, we have to stop driving into places like Scott's Edition and saying, oh my God, the traffic's too bad. I can't find a, a parking space. We have to look at that and say, this is great. I can't find a parking space because there are tons of people collecting to do something awesome right? That when we're driving on 288 and we're thinking, oh my gosh, the traffic's crazy. And wait a minute, that's thousands of people commuting to and from work, right? And when those thousands of people come into communities like this, what happens? They're buying things, they're changing, they're innovating, they're forcing change. When they're buying things, they're spending money, they're paying taxes. Those taxes are going into our education system, which is feeding our kids, which is making this community even better. 
right? And that's how we have to look at things in this community. This building or this space was designed by Dave and I. Um, and when we put the plans together for this space, Dave and I were absolutely certain that we would try to support everything local that we possibly could, okay? In any feasible way, we said the lighting to the paint, to the carpet, to the desk that you see, everything has got to be a function of our community because that's what our business is, right? And no matter how much it takes, how long it takes, and, and, and often, no matter how much it costs, it is more important that we support our local community and our build out. So when you come in here, you say, hey, that's my artwork, or that's my paint, or that's my carpet, or that's my light bulb, whatever. This is you. That's what we said, right? Everything here is a function of that. And even more importantly, as Dave and I had been involved in our community, we said, well, how can we, how can we demonstrate some really innovative qualities? What do we do here? And, and in particular, our business really engages in our art community, right? And if you don't have a thriving art community in a community, you, you have nothing, okay? That, that, that is a fact, right? That is a fact. That is the creativity, that is the engagement. There are so many qualities associated with that. I know I don't have to speak to you long about that, right? And there's one particular person that I have done work with for many, many years. Um, I think he's probably the only more creative person than I consider myself. He's so creative that it, it, it's like on a level of brilliance. And he and I began talking many years ago about like, what, how could the business community and the art community do some really cool things? How could we engage things? And he and I, I'm going to introduce my friend Ed Trask here in a minute. Okay, this is one of the world's great muralists. Okay, right here in this community. He and I came up with this concept that we said, well, you know, okay, if Dominion Payroll Services is a collection of our community, how about if we, if we do some murals? How about if we paint, right? But rather than me painting this, Ed saying that, how, how about you paint it, Dave? And how about your employees and about the kids of your employees and, and the people that are part of your business? How about, how about they paint it? We thought, oh my God, that's brilliant, Ed. That's brilliant. That way, everybody here is part of the fabric of Dominion Payroll, right? And so Ed and I devised this plan, and some of you saw this over the last three months, right? He came in with a pencil, and he started drawing on a wall, and that's how it all begins, right? Just one line, two lines, three lines. Next thing you know, there's a, a four-by-four four sketch. Next thing you know, there's this huge, huge pencil of this really crazy looking thing. And he started going in and he started putting numbers all over it. He made it easy for us, right? And those numbers translated into colors. And he said, all right, Dominion Payroll, <laughs> I know you got some creativity. Number two is blue, number three is black, number three, you know, go to it, guys. And we thought, oh my gosh, we can't do that. We're not artists, we don't know what to do. I can't even paint in the lines. What are you talking about? I can't do that. So, you know, we do, we do, we go up and we say, all right, I'll just, I'll just start, right? And it was brilliant. It was awesome. Our employees started getting engaged and they started doing things and you could just see that they felt like they were part of this amazing piece of art and something that reflected our community. And Ed guided us. And having him here in this business, I can tell you for the three months that he was here, it was like having a visiting professor in creativity, right? Our employees couldn't stop talking to him. Just like, Ed, what do you think about this? Let me, let me show you what I do, right? Maybe I work on benefits or math or time and attendance. And here's an artist saying, wow, that's cool. You know, reflection on that. What an interesting conversation for us to have. It was so amazing that as he was finishing up the project, there was almost a pall in the business like, God, I, I really don't want him to leave, right? I mean, he doesn't do anything productive here, but I, I, <laughs> how, do, how, do, how do I let a guy like that walk out of the building? I mean, our employees couldn't stop seeing this as something that was amazing in our business, okay? And that's when Ed and I really thought, said, man, this is, this is cool. We, we need to tell our, our business friends about this. Uh, they need to do something like this, whether it's with Ed, and, and there are thousands of Eds in our community. There are, okay? We said, 
man, maybe maybe there's more to this than just Dominion Payroll and, and Ed Trash. Maybe this is maybe, you know, the way our local community can do some more cool things. And so, look, yeah, you're going to hear about your end tax and benefits, but you know what you're going to hear about today? You're going to hear a little bit about how can you engage in your art community? You know, how can you inspire your employees to maybe enjoy their workday a little more, right? Or feel like they're part of something a little more than just producing a widget right, or baking a biscuit or producing a payroll? How can they feel like they're part of something more? Because I'm telling you, the result of that for us was engagement at all levels. It really was. They were very proud to feel like that. I know that I'm part of that. I felt that way, right? So much so that Ed and I have begun um, to discuss a series where, where we're going to gather our local entrepreneurs and he's going to gather his artists we're going to start this stuff. We're going to start doing this on, on some frequency where we're, we're asking our, our friends in business to meet our, our artists and, and community and, and really doing some neat things. And what if our community became known for that, right? Well, what if? Or, or what if nothing happens? What's the worst, right? What a cool concept. Welcome to the new headquarters of Dominion Payroll. Uh, you are all our guests, and you're the reason we were able to do this. Thank you on behalf of Dave and I and the 85 employees or however many we have here. You guys, this is this day, this moment right here is what it's all about. I'm honored to host you, and it means a lot that we don't have to go to another community place to host a seminar, that we are the community place to get to host a seminar. That was the dream for all these years, all right? Um, and so before we dive into some of the more technical stuff, I've asked my very dear friend, Ed Trask, to come up and talk about his art and the way he's engaged with us and, and quite frankly, whatever he wants to talk about. And, and you will see what I mean, but it can go in a lot of ways, but it all is amazing and awesome. And it all comes back to one really cool purpose. Ed, you're my brother. Thank you for being here, right? Last time I was here, I couldn't find him. I knew he was here because I saw his bike. He was up on the roof. All right, so <laughs> I'm just glad I've got him in this space. Ed Trask. All right, so I want to start this real quick. I'm going, to, I'm going to just rapid flash a bunch of images and talk about how I got started and just my whole process of becoming the person that I am today. Now, what you're looking at right there, that's a Pizarro painting. And I want you to go real quick and just think about this. I'm a kid about this big. My Harvard MIT academic father thinks culturally it's important to take that kid that big to see some art. So he takes me to the National Gallery to the Impressionist Show, right? So here we go. You've been to the National Gallery in DC. It's lovely. It's grandiose. We come in and there's Impressionist paintings everywhere. I walk through the hall and that is what I see. It's a bizarre painting. And it is impasto. It is lovely. It's all this oil paint. And it's, blah, blah, blah. it's just splattered on top of canvas. And as soon as I walked in, the first thing I did was I looked at it and I walked right up to it and I just went, Whoa. I put my hands all over it. I was fondling an impressionist painting. My father's going, oh, the, the guards are going, sir, 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 get your son. I was just like, oh, how did that happen? How could he do that? My father said he knew at that point I wasn't going to be the academic, that my, I wasn't working from the same side of the brain that he was. <laughs> but that was all right. He let it go. I was seeing the world in a different manner. I was also growing up seeing the world in a manner of skateboards and rock music. I was drawing every skateboard logo, every kind of rock and roll logo I could. Kiss rocked! Kiss was amazing growing up as a kid. Oh, man. If I, I just loved Kiss. And I loved Rush because I started playing drums. And who didn't want to be Neil Peart, right? Tom Sawyer, dun, dun, da, da. It was so good. At the same time, we had these regional things that were happening. We didn't have the internet to tell us what was cool, but we had friends to tell us what was cool. I grew up in Loudoun County, Virginia. We weren't that far from DC. You had this incredible go-go thing happening. You also had incredible punk rock. And at the same time that I was finding stuff like Minor Threat, and I was finding all these crazy punk rock things that my father hated, I was finding go-go, and I could go to D.C., even though I was 15 and wasn't supposed to. Sorry, Dad. I could still go see this stuff, and it was changing my life. Because what was happening was you were getting this community. It looks all rebellious and insane, but you were grabbing all these people together that were saying, we think the government should be different. We think this should be different. 
we don't have anybody that's like us at all. And then you go to these shows and you realize, oh my gosh, there's a lot of people like us. We're all together in this. And then one person can make a big difference, but when that one person joins with more and more people, you can make a bigger difference. And that's what punk rock meant to me. Obviously, when you're a punk rock kid and you're trying to wear a mohawk, you get picked on. My creative escape was that. I made art, anything I could do to make art. Meanwhile, my family, my father's creative escape was that. My father used to go to the MIT website to audit math classes for fun. Yeah, brilliant man. That's my daughter. That's how she has fun. She's on the, on the other side of the brain spectrum. That's good. So when I graduated at VCU, I started to realize that I wasn't making a difference in the gallery scene because my art just wasn't that good. Yeah. But I couldn't get in galleries. I couldn't get anywhere. So I knew I had to take it to the community. Oh, I'm missing a slide. There it is. So I started doing it outdoors. I started taking every dilapidated building and saying, guess what? This building should be a coffee shop. This building should be something else. This neighborhood's a beautiful neighborhood. It just needs love. It needs something to show that change can happen. And I thought that change could happen through something creative, like a mural. So what I did was I put on a fake jumpsuit. I got my paint out in broad daylight. I sat there. I was reading a book from Isaac Bastian Singer, and I was reading it. I went, you know what? I'm going to do a quick portrait from that. Jumped up, broad daylight. I painted this illegally. And then I finished it, and there was a hill right up here. I sat back up in the hill, and I stared at it. And here comes this three cocktail lunch dude going back to work. And he's going like this, right? And all of a sudden, he goes up, and he sees the painting and goes, wow, I'm across the street. He has no idea that I just painted the damn thing illegally. So I'm just looking at him, and I'm going, oh, yeah. Oh, my God. He looks at it and goes, God, that sucks. And he walks away. That was my first lesson that I realized that I had made him take that second to make that creative interpretation. I took him out of his cocktail days, his corporate life that he was in, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what he was doing. But I made him take a second to think how that affected the environment. Why was that there? How does it affect his life? What on earth does the angle mean to this really poorly drawn face? Like, what is going on? And I was addicted. I was hooked. I started doing it everywhere. I was also playing in punk rock bands, and I was traveling the world playing this punk rock music, now playing drums. So everywhere I went, I was doing these illegal murals. That's London. That was in Amsterdam. I was in love with John Cage, so I did a portrait of John Cage. Everywhere I went, I carried a paint kit, and I did these illegal murals because I felt like that's what I was supposed to do. This is Washington, D.C., I knew the DC, still playing punk rock music. I didn't know there was anybody else doing this as much because we didn't have the internet. Everything was regionalistic. Art or graffiti, yeah, whatever. But I was also painting canvases and I was also trying to make a living by doing canvases and just, I knew I had to keep being creative and keep painting because that's what I knew I had to do. Around me, you started hearing of the, the Keith Herrings. You started hearing of these people that were changing the world through street art and through public art. You had people painting on trains, people doing monikers, things that were really people reaching out to communicate. They were trying to make a connection to everybody. And we all know, and early we know, we, are, we have an innate quality in all of us that we have to connect to somebody else. And so I thought that's what art was doing. The mural projects of Philadelphia were changing my life. I could see that communities were changing. Community gardens were pairing up with muralists and areas in Philadelphia were changing. So I went to Philadelphia to research that. I started going all around. My paintings were more of the WPA style. They were very kind of classic, old style. That's my great aunt Lillian. She was awesome. Cape Cod lady, mm. That's my awesome wife and her father, Irish rugby player, Burley, good guy. So then I started realizing we need to take this and start putting it on walls, but maybe doing it legally would be helpful. So I went to Plaza Art and said, look, I'll paint your sign for you if you give me this space to do this. This is 90. If you give me this space right here to paint a mural. It was one of my first connections with a business. And the business, they looked at me and said, what? Why? 
I was like, well, you, do you want people to look at your space? The first step is to have people notice you. You have a quality product, it's gonna continue and you've got them. Let me get them looking at you first and then we'll go from there. And it worked. And the business kept going and it kept going and it kept going and I was lucky to keep getting this work. With restaurants, I realized, is my art gonna be better sitting in my studio? No. Is it gonna make any kind of change with anybody? Is anyone gonna change their mind when it sits in my studio? Not at all. When Johnny Java's father came to him and said, Johnny, buy a ton of plywood, build these things, make sandwiches really thick. Make sure your, your beer is cold, call it Sidewalk Cafe. It's an icon now, he did. We came together and I said, I wanna paint this painting. He came to me and said, okay, I don't care what it is, just make sure it has something to do with Sidewalk Cafe. So I just wrote Miss Sidewalk right there. That was it, he didn't care what it was. But it became this partnership, and he realized from the beginning that having the art on there create, made this conversation. As soon as people walked in the door, they walked in a different person, and it worked. I started doing the same thing. Motor Europe, an old motorcycle place here. International roofing, the story of this guy. His father was a European roofer. He moved here. He thought it was the most boring story in the world. I didn't. He's a third generation roofer. You don't have that anymore. So I came to him and said, well, cool. I'm going to paint the story of your father working in Europe, coming in here, then you doing the Pamplin War Center. I think that's a cool story and people should hear about it. And I realized mural painting should become about the story. Virginia Elevator, that used to be right down here. Same thing. The guy had a fear of heights. So he started an elevator company. What? And then it led to friends. Cuba Cuba. Been friends with Manny since forever more stuff for Johnny. And then while this is going on, I'm, I'm gonna be fast guys, but when this is going on, I wasn't always making a living, so I became a carpenter. I used a baby because I sucked at it. Renovating houses, I'm so sorry. Then I was a plumber's assistant to try just to do anything to keep being an artist. Six months plumber's assistant, don't ever do that. Bike messenger, three years I was a bike messenger and doing art. That was awesome. Not as glamorous as you think that man. I worked, I waited tables. Anything I could do, I worked at Millage forever. I would just have one or two shifts there to make money, but that one or two shifts let me have these connections with all these different people. Instead of walking around serving eggs to people going, God, I hate my life, this job sucks. Here are your eggs, more iced tea. I took that as an opportunity to make a connection to a person. Believe it or not, I made that optimistic. I would come and be like, how are you doing? I remember you. I ended up never getting my work done because I ended up having conversations with every single damn person in the restaurant, but it was a way that I learned so much. Being in the service industry is important. Take a year out of college and work your ass off. It's a lot better sometimes for a person, I believe. I did old historic Tredegar. I started partnering up with different old places, different places that were important. Then I went to Stewart School. In the Stewart School, they were saying the same thing. How can you do something that you can engage our kids? So I said, all right, let's get them all in the same room. Let's work on something. Let's, let's talk about a mural. What do they love? Frank Sinatra. Really? And then I started realizing, man, we can do it in a different way. We can do it in a, in a way like paint by numbers. So I started doing these drawings and I started doing something that could bring it in. But the real change happened when I had an art show. I did all the paintings. I put it up in the gallery. The show was getting ready to open the next day. I sat my table up where I was gonna put my food and I realized the same thing was gonna happen like it happens every single time. My friends are gonna walk in and go, cool paintings, where's the beer? What kind of food do you have? And I went, you know what, I gotta change this. So I took all those paintings I just painted, I took pictures of them, I rolled over the paintings. Then I went back and drew them in lines like this and then I numbered them. And then I put where all the food and beer was supposed to be, I put numbered paint and brushes. So when they came in that night, they looked at the paintings, they were like, oh, I don't really get it. Then they went down to look at the beer and food and they were numbered paint and they went, oh, you gotta be kidding me. Like, no, you gotta paint my paintings. Ha <laughs> ha. And they did. And what I found was it elicited this lovely childlike response. It became this inclusive thing where all of a sudden, they realized they were part of my art and I was part of what they wanted. We just did this huge collaborative piece together. Whether they liked it or not, they did it. And within the end, by the end of that show, all my paintings were repainted for me. It was a really cool thing, but it changed my life. And that's when I took it to Stewart School. 
And we started doing that, and that's what came of that empty hall. And the guy who loves Frank Sinatra and Coltrane and different folks. And so working with these kids at Seven Hills School, working, we went to the community and went door to door and asked the people at Seven Hills, how did 95 disrupt your neighborhood? What happened when that happened? Who, are, who, is, who should we talk about in a mural that's in your neighborhood? And they gave us all the ideas from, the, from Maggie Walker to Douglas to, to you name it. James Baldwin, Webb Du Bois, everybody, it was there. And we put them up there because the community said they wanted it. And the kids painted it in and I kind of smoothed it out. Meanwhile, I'm painting stuff. My, my work is getting everywhere. Stuff is abstracting, but I'm telling the story of our community. This is right down the street near, Scott's, near um, Rockets Landing. The sky does not look like that, but I'm an artist so I can do what I want. It was fantastic. So in the search for getting these ideas, I started realizing that in Scott's edition and all around, there were some beautiful, inspiring things. You just had to open your eyes to look. And I started finding that so many of the great ideas that would come to us in any context were right in front of us sometimes. It was if we could just take that inner breath and take a moment to open our eyes to look and to see what was right in front of us. Then I went and did a Brazil trip where I donated three weeks to do a mural for this little town in Brazil. I went through their whole history with a historian there, worked with kids from every walk of life from Brazil, and we painted this mural in Brazil. It was the story of this town in southern Brazil. It was humbling, it was amazing, it was really, really hard work. But then it was finished. Back there, is a portrait of this gentleman. His name is Susha. Susha was a historian who knew the whole town, knew everybody. That's the mayor, that's me. Yeah, the mayor. It turned out beautiful. We made a connection. Kids had no idea what the story was, what was happening. They had no idea why their town was what it was. But it changed the way they saw it because they came and painted their story with me. At the end, when I came home, the gentleman who I showed here because he was the historian that everyone loved, he, had, he died three weeks after I came back home. And so we were so lucky to have put Susha up on the wall. And while I was painting him, kids would go by and be like, yeah, Susha! It was awesome to see. And that was the final result. But that's when I realized it wasn't about me. It was about stripping your ego and trying to make a connection with a business, with a community, with a nonprofit to make something bigger, to make bigger change. And that if you have something beautiful, full of light, full of color, full of love, put it out there. Don't be embarrassed. Let people interpret it and see it. And then they can connect with it and they can make change that way. So I met with John Belisles. We had talked to him. We said, we're, we want to do the street art festival. The first street art festival we did was on the canal. We did that. How can we change this area, which at that point, nobody would walk around. I would ride my mountain bike on the way to the trails past it, and I kept thinking this should be an outdoor gallery. That was the idea I came up with, and then we did it, and people thought we were crazy, but it worked. We started bringing other muralists. It wasn't about just us, one individual artist. It was about the community and all of the artists, and how could that make an actual change? We had panel discussions with these street artists at the VMFA so that the public could ask them, why are you important? What, I don't understand why you're here. We brought these artists here. They started the first brushstroke on Tuesday. They put the last brushstroke down on Sunday. The public was there for all of it. So you watched every little part of that mural go up. And what we found was it was a giant success. So then we needed a bigger obstacle. We took on the GRTC plant, which was run down and vacant at that point. And we teamed up with Studio 2-3 and a lot of great artists. And we put up a giant, giant outdoor gallery. We took kids there. We had classes there. We discussed what had happened there. And we brought world-class artists. And then we took it to the Southern States building and did the same thing. That was me lucky enough to open up the groundbreaking for the ICA. Now, 
I love looking at this picture because it goes from that picture in my eyes to me sitting up on a hill, being that little punky kid watching the guy say my art sucked. I'm not saying my art doesn't suck still, but I'm, the mo I'm blessed and so lucky to have had every connection, every business owner, every person that has put faith in me to let me get this far, to be able to do that to the point where the ICA said, yeah, do what you want, paint a big circle mural. We're gonna break ground, this would be really cool. I'm a lucky person, but I knew change could happen. We went to the diamond and we hooked up with the flying squirrels. When we first thought about it, I was like, what are we going to do with the flying squirrel? This is ridiculous, but it feels right. As soon as we met with them, we realized the flying squirrels aren't about baseball. Yeah, they have a baseball team. They're about family. They're about community. They're about going there and having a blast. You're not just there seeing if that guy's throwing 90 miles an hour. You're going there to see the guy get the pie in the face and then have your kid have a blast we knew it was the right place. So we reinvented the diamond to make a conversation happen, a collaboration, a partnership with a business, with the end goal to have people come to a creative decision and to have people get the hell out of their phone for one second. It's the hardest thing with my daughter and my kids, everybody. It's so hard to not live in your phone. But if you open your eyes and see what's around you, you see beautiful things. We see like in Philly in different places where people can take fake and empty buildings, add a little bit of color and change it. I have no idea why that is in there. <laughs> oh my God, that's my kid. That's my kid, that's my awesome wife. And that's me trying to be James Kirk. That's my daughter taking that moment. Where's her telephone? I don't see it. Fringe benefits. <laughs> I want to talk about, <laughs> anyway, this all leads to one thing. And that is, if you bring an artist, a musician, if you bring anybody that is thinking something different within your business, your corporation, and you let them thrive, crazy things happen. It opens up the mind of different people. I did a mural for Dominion Power at Lincoln Center where at the, at the, um, Oh, it's their Herndon headquarters, where they asked me, like, we want you to do a mural. It's really gray and it's dark in there. We want you to do something. I went, huh, what if I take these transmission towers and all these power lines and I make this three, four waltz? And I talk to them and I say, every time you're walking down the hall, I want you to think of a waltz. One, two, three, dun, dun, dun. And I did it, this 50-foot mural down the hall. And the coolest thing was the raddest of linemen are walking past going like this. And then I started thinking they should bring a celloist in downstairs on Tuesday so they can display, so somebody can play cello while they walk in. That little bit of difference, but it works. So my plea is please, if you wanna see creative change, you wanna see left to the right, you wanna see people look at really challenging problems in a different way, Invite a fabric artist, invite a silk screener from Studio 23, invite a drama, a dramatist from the school, bring in a ballet dancer to do a twirl. I mean, bring, there are so many incredibly talented artists in this city. Let them thrive in your company and you'll see massive change. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. It's a segue I never thought would exist from uh, such a great icon of our community that we get to interact with, engage with, to uh, a little more of the serious side of why we're here today with fringe benefits and tax and benefits updates with ACA. My name's John Griffin. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, just wanted to come up and make a couple announcements and recognize a few folks. Angie Trapp, one, um, our director of training, many of you know her, have talked with her, dealt with her on the phone. She's great. She does such a great job, goes above and beyond every year putting this together. And I hope everyone uh, enjoys the experience this morning. And our marketing department, Brad Crouch, Andy Liguori, and Kevin, uh, really did a ton of work over the last couple of weeks to get this pulled together, get the technology. This is the first year we're doing it in this space. Um, this is also the first year we're doing it as a webinar. So we have people that are dialed in from Florida, from North Carolina, from Nashville. So we have a, a huge audience today. So I hope everyone uh, will get, take a little bit away from this. As far as an announcement, um, the information you're going to see and hear about today is going to be available on our website. We're also going to get it out on the homepage 
when you log into iSolved under the quick links, it'll be there. So don't worry too much. Don't stress about taking notes today and getting every single detail. There is a lot of detail in the coming slides. Um, it'll all be out there and available to you shortly. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Katie and she's gonna go through Fringe Benefits. Thank you. All right, good morning. How many of you guys, this is your first year in with Dominion Payroll? All right, so I've got a few hands. I want everyone in person to take a look at the calendar that's in your notebook. Everyone online, click the little button in the bottom right hand corner of your computer and pull up December or January, either one works. I want you to notice that December 30th is a Saturday and December 31st is a Sunday. Now why am I pointing that out instead of talking about fringe benefits? And the reason is that payroll has deadlines, money needs to move, and that means if you want anything dated in 2017, your last data process is actually Wednesday, December 27th. And everyone likes to forget about year end. You guys are the good clients. You're here in person or you're listening online. But it's easy to forget that the 2017 ends until you reach December 30th. So I'm going to point that out now. And I'll point it out again at the end just to make sure that you have your deadlines in place. They're also in the year end guide. So make sure you take a look at those. They are optimistic. I realize that. If your accountant can't get you the numbers until January 2nd, that's fine. We can accommodate it. But just make sure if you need your money pooled in 2017, that Wednesday or that Thursday is the absolute last day. So if that is something that your company cares about as far as doing your books, that's the date you want to keep in mind. And with that, I don't have anything terribly exciting as far as our work and community changing, but I do have the boring things that are why you're here for your end seminar. So we'll get started with fringe benefits. So this is the five whys. So you guys are our clients. We have a great customer service team of which I am a part of and the email address is here on the slide as well as in your paper. That's your one stop shop. Regardless of if it's a tax question, a benefits question, all of it can go to customer service. We'll get you where you need to go. We've got a number of different things happening at the end of the year on your end that we want to help you with, whether you've got fringe benefits, which is a catch-all term for the things you have to record during the calendar year so that the W-2s are populated correctly. It may or may not involve money moving. It may or may not involve taxes. Your accountant is the be-all, end-all for the whys, the whats. We do the how. You give us the numbers, we'll tell you how to enter it in iSolved, or we'll do it for you. There we go. So as I said, fringe benefits is a catch-all term. I have a few different types of fringe benefits listed below. The key things that you're gonna to wanna to think about are how does the money actually move? If you're paying someone a car allowance and it's taxable, but they're not actually getting any money on the paycheck where they're getting the car allowance because you're doing a special run at the end of December, you either need to pay them more to cover their Social Security and Medicare or you need to pull it from their federal taxes or somehow account for the money. So there's a number of things to think about. Your accountant or your CPA can give you different options that make sense to your business. If you call us, we're more than happy to walk you through the options, how to enter them. As far as the how to enter them, a spreadsheet is going to be your best friend. I was working with our training department, Ashley, up in Boston to put together, and I know I'm soft-spoken, I will fix this. I can see Andy looking at me to get this better. So there's going to be a video online in Dominion Payroll, and we can also walk you through it, how to get an export of your employee numbers with the employee names. The employee names are for you. The employee numbers are for the computer. The computer doesn't know that John Smith is John Smith. He knows that he's employee number two. So that's what we need to get that imported. It'll make your life a lot easier. It'll make things a lot faster. The year-end guide also has different ways that we can get in touch with you and ways that you can give us the information we need. Group term life is one of the more complicated as far as calculated fringe benefits. Thank you, Angie. So if group term life, you know, anything above $50,000 for an employee dependent or, or employee or $2,000 for their dependents is taxable. And that's based on an IRS wa wage table that is based on your age of the employee. So there is a calculator inside of us, I solve that'll do that for you. So I'm pointing that out now because if you want to not have the calculations to do in 2018, January 1, 2018 is probably the time you want to get that started in I solve. So again, reach out to customer service. We can get that started for you. The other common one we see is shareholder health for employees of your company who are more than 2% shareholders. The insurance paid by the company for their health insurance is actually taxable for federal and state income taxes. It's a really easy adjustment to do. We just need the numbers and who those employees are. Auto allowances are another common one. I'm going through all the details mostly so you can look at the slides later. Don't Remember, remember everything I'm saying, it's easy enough to look back on. But there's a number of ways these can be calculated. Your CPA, your accountant, it's based on mileage, it's based on the value of the car, and it can be done several different ways. If you come to us and say, 
someone has a car, he drove 2,000 miles, we're going to say, okay, great, now what? And that's because you could do it a number of different ways depending on how your business does your accounting. So when it comes to questions like that, your accountant's actually the best one because they know exactly how you're doing your books, they know exactly how you're filing your taxes, and they're going to get you the most bang for your buck and tell you to do it the best way for you. And that could be different for every person in this room. So we've got our general rules of thumb. I've covered all of them already in the talk. We just want to have them here on the slideshow for you to reference later. Key points are accountant first. We'll help you get it in. Excel is your friend. And remember that December 27th is a Wednesday. And that's the last technical due date for when we can pull money on a Thursday to pay people on a Friday and have that count for 2017 without baking it and doing it next year. Now that we've got the boring parts out of the way, we have the fun part, which is bonus payrolls. So this is the fun part of the holiday season here at uh, Dominion Payroll, where we get to help you help your employees if they get a one-time spot bonus, whether it's performance or maybe you give them a holiday bonus for the end of the year. Or if you don't give a bonus, that's perfectly fine. But if you have a special payroll run, all these rules still apply. So a special payroll run is something that happens outside your normal schedule. If you normally pay semi-monthly, but you don't want it to be on their normal paycheck, you want to surprise them on a Wednesday, or you need to get that special fringe benefit payroll run again on that Wednesday, December 27th, you're going to want to run what's called a special payroll. We're going to need to schedule it for you. It's going to be outside your normal run. You don't have permission to schedule payrolls because that's a lot of responsibility and we prefer to take that on. So for bonus payrolls, there's a few key points. These are a few examples. The questions we're going to ask you are up on the screen. It's again the who, what, when, where, and how. We're going to ask you how the employees are being paid, whether they're going to receive a live check, whether it's going to be direct deposit, whether you want something special. Maybe you want it mailed somewhere different so that they don't recognize the payroll package coming to your normal place of delivery. Maybe you want to cover the taxes somewhat differently. Maybe you're covering Social Security, Medicare, so they get a flat $100 instead of giving an awkward $93.45. So you've got a number of different things to think about. And knowing those questions before you call us, we have a handy-dandy link in Zendesk that we'll be able to give you. So you can fill all this out online. We'll be able to get the answers to your questions to help this go really smoothly. We've got the process smoothed down a lot over past years, so you'll be able to go through do your bonus payrolls without too much of a hitch, but you do need to know the answers to those questions. We don't know them for you. Again, it's your business. And so these are the two things that you actually want to pay attention to. We've got customer service at dominionpayroll.com. That is the email address. It goes into our ticketing system. It gets you any answer you need to know. And that's also our phone number, which I admittedly do not know this one. I actually started here as a receptionist for about two weeks. It's 804-355-3430. But I do not know that one, but it's 866-DPS-PAY-YOU if you call in, and that goes to any of our locations. So if you call in from Florida, maybe it goes to Florida, or if you're calling into our Nashville office, that's how you talk to someone in Nashville instead of someone from Richmond. So that's the main line for the corporate line here. And again, both of those will get you the answers you need to know. I do recommend email and Excel for anything fringe or bonus related. If we're auditing, when we're auditing behind you or us, it helps to have it written down instead of someone translating names and numbers from the phone. So again, email and Excel, employee numbers, and December 27th is a Wednesday. All right. I believe that's the end of my slide. It is. And next up is merchant services. There he is, PJ. Something a little bit more exciting, so here we go. He's going to talk all about an auxiliary service that we offer, technically through his own company. So here we go. Okay. All right, good morning. How are everybody doing today? Good. All right, so I'm Patrick Gallagher. Um, for those who have been with, with us for a while, um, I was with Dominion Payroll about three days after I graduated from college. My brother got me in here stuffing payrolls and delivering payrolls out to a lot of clients. Um, I transitioned that into, I was a tax manager for a number of years, so this time of the year used to be miserable for me. I used to be stuck in that office getting ready to prepare W-2s and year-end filings and stuff like that, and after pulling out a lot of my hair, as you can see, a lot of it's gone away, I said, I need to get out of this, I need to get into sales, I want to find something else to do, and so <clears throat> uh, about seven years ago, uh, with the Davids, I co-founded uh, DB Payments. Uh, it's merchant services, so for any business that accepts credit cards, um, we wanted to kind of do the same thing we've done with Dominion Payroll, which is find a way to offer better products, better service at a better price. So the merchant services side of it really kind of went hand in hand with our clients. A lot of our clients accept credit cards, so we wanted to come out and introduce this to you guys. So we've been doing it for about seven years, and we're just trying to continue to make that push into our client base, letting you guys know that we have another way we can help you out aside from payroll. So um, we focus on helping businesses ease the pain associated with accepting credit cards. So this is, um, it can be, 
quite complicated nowadays. There's a lot of bad guys out there trying to get your customers' information. So we focus on making sure you're secure. Um, and it's also, it can be very expensive. A lot of folks out there who want to sell this to you and make as much money as possible and kind of rip you off. We find a lot of times we're saving clients uh, thousands to tens of, tens of thousands of dollars a year. Um, by keeping it under one roof, we try and focus on saving you uh, some money. So um, who do we help? We really, anybody who accepts credit cards, um, we have technology for you. Um, whether it's retail, um, if your card not present, Moda, which is mail order, telephone order, uh, e-commerce, mobile processing, and then we've got a new product to talk about called zero fee processing. So if you accept credit cards, no matter what you do, we have a solution for you. <clears throat> For retail restaurants, pretty simple. A lot of times you just need a machine or you've got a point of sale system. We can integrate with any major point of sale system. But we also have a wide variety of terminals that we can plug in for your retail shops. If you need a point of sale system, you're looking for uh, some good ones or some really expensive ones out there we know about. We also have some inexpensive ones we can help plug you into and really kind of advise you. We don't sell them. We know the good guys out there. We know the bad guys out there. We like to act as an advisor and help point you in the right direction. Um, and then also, yeah, for a lot of retail restaurant, mobile processing is the new cool thing. We've got an app that can go on your phone to process transactions remotely. All right. Mail order, telephone order, uh, card not present. This is really, uh, I would say 70% of our clients are this type of client. They aren't necessarily retail. Uh, they're not seeing the client face to face. Um, they are collecting payments through uh, invoices, over the phone, through email. Um, they've got a wide variety of ways they accept credit cards. And we've got a fantastic option for them. Our virtual terminal that we have, it's basically where any employee can log into our, uh, what we call a virtual terminal. You'll be able to run credit cards through there. It's got a whole suite of uh, technology that can do it. We can store cards for your customers securely so you're not managing those on a spreadsheet or in a file cabinet. Uh, your employees don't have to write numbers down. If you run a card for a transaction for a customer and you realize two weeks later you need to go back and adjust the transaction or run them, run them again, um, you have full access to all those cards stored securely, but nobody has access to the card numbers. They're, they're what's called tokenized. They turn into a collection of numbers that can't be hacked and um, it's fully secure. We also offer recurring billing in there too. So if you have folks who need to set up, you know, once a month billing for program, you can set it up to run for up to only for five payments, or if you want to run it every quarter or every year, um, every week, whatever it is, we have a whole selection of options for recurring billing too. So that's um, a large part of our clients see the need for that. In this as well, a lot of our clients have seen a value, uh, a new thing that we add, which is called level two and level three processing. This is something that most of you probably don't know about. Um, the clients in here who are mine do know about level two, level three processing. This is for any client that accepts credit cards from other businesses. If you are selling products or services to other businesses and they're, or, or governments, <clears throat> and they are paying with what we call P cards, purchasing cards, or just business cards, that's one of the most expensive credit cards you as a business can accept. It's the most expensive credit card. Um, Visa MasterCard, in an effort to get businesses to be willing to accept credit cards from other businesses, have started to offer lower rates to businesses to incentivize them to do business-to-business -business transactions via credit card. In doing so, they introduced level two and level three rates. It's basically a different interchange rate, and it brings a, a where a normal business card would be 2.7% to your business, it brings it down to 1.85% or 1.9%. Um, in order to do this, you have to enter in a ton of information per transaction. You have to enter in the Fed ID of both companies, the shipping address, the PO number, invoice number, sales tax amount, um, the quantity, the freight amount, all the stuff that most of your businesses never even collect. It doesn't exist in your transactions. But well, we've de developed technology in accordance with the Visa, Ma Visa MasterCard regulations that basically auto defaults those fields. On the back end, you don't even see, you go in and type in the credit card number. When we get that approval back, on the back end, we know that that's a business card. We take all those fields and just smack a whole bunch of meaningless information in there. Um, and in, in, in doing that, the Visa MasterCard regulations, they see that and reclassify that at the lower rate. So if you're running a credit card right now, a business card, and you're just running it as is, you're going to pay 2.65%. You're not going to enter any information, and you're going to be paying more. With our technology, you're going to earn that same information, but you're going to get it for 1.85%. So if you are accepting business cards or government cards, Definitely worth your time just to hear us out and see what we can do for you. I guarantee you we can help you out with that. <clears throat> E-commerce obviously is a big thing nowadays. So we've got a wide variety of options for folks who are accepting credit cards over the uh, websites. Either you're selling products on websites, or you just want customers to have a one-click option where they don't have to deal with, with a person. A lot of times nowadays people don't want to actually call. They just want to go on the website and 
click pay now. So we've got a host of payment page. We've got pay now, donate now for nonprofits. Um, we can integrate to any of the major shopping carts out there. So if you are offering to an on online retail, we, we can integrate with any uh, major shopping cart out there and we work with most internet gateways as well. So anything you need online, we can help you out with. Mobile processing, I mentioned it earlier. This can go in a wide variety. We've got a lot of retail restaurants that need mobile processing, but as well, we've got a lot of folks who do um, just normal back office uh, processing, but they occasionally do um, a trade show or they'll, they'll, or they'll do an event, they'll do a fundraiser, and they need to be able to accept credit cards. They've been running credit cards through a computer all this time, but they also, for one time a year, they need to go out and run credit cards in person. Well, through our, through our app, they can do the same thing as they always would, but they bring up the phone or they bring up an iPad and they can run payments anywhere. The cool part about it is that it immediately shows up in the virtual terminal, so you can adjust anything from the virtual terminal in the back office. Um, as well, if you're, it's especially great for fundraisers or something like that. If you are, want to set up donors on recurring payments, you can run a one-time transaction on the mobile app and then instantly go into the virtual terminal and store that credit card information. So you can create a customer profile and create a billing history with that customer. So it really helps out too. And then lastly, this is, the, this is the piece that I think I'm most excited about. This is something that is very new to the industry. Um, and, and I think it can, it's going to change the way that businesses are accepting credit cards and paying for credit cards. And I think we're really on the cusp of something new and innovative, innovative and I'm really excited about it. So every business, now is paying two and a half to three to four percent of their bottom line to accept credit cards. They are just losing that's money that they are losing that 20 years ago it wasn't the case. Um, the government has been restrictive on allowing businesses to pass that fee along to their customers. Um, they basically weren't allowing it for a number of years. They started relaxing those regulations, and now they said, "Okay, you can do it, but you got to do all this reg you got to do all this registration with all the card brands. You got to stay in compliance with whatever your state says you have to do." And so businesses have been like, well, we don't want to do that because then you got to deal with all these regulations. You got to make sure the state is going to be in compliance. We're going to be in compliance with the state and the states are always changing their rules and regulations. <clears throat> We've partnered with the team that has taken all those registrations and basically we handle that now in-house. So if you are a business that wants to pass the fees onto a customer, we call it a surcharge, we then will sign you up with all, we'll register you with all the card brands. Um, we will make sure that your state regulations you're in compliance with all the state regulations and you know what those regulations are and we've developed the technology that when you type in if a customer owes you a hundred dollars you type in a hundred dollars when they swipe their card or when you enter their card it will reprocess that transaction to show hundred three dollars and fifty cents for a three and a half percent surcharge to them um, it represents it to the customer saying you are being assessed a surcharge and then they click on approve now i will say that a lot of businesses nowadays aren't ready to do that and that's fine this is this is right now for verticals that are are willing to do that. Either you're in a um, non-competitive industry where you're not worried about losing a customer, or you're in an industry where it's expected that most fees you assess are being passed on to the customer. Um, or there are some businesses that are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, or million you know millions of dollars a year, and they figure that well, we're going to save so much money that if we lose a custom, couple customers on along the way, it's worth it to us. We've got one client, a Dominion Payroll client, who's now a uh, zero fee processes, they're saving a million and a half dollars a year to their bottom line for doing nothing other than this. And they, their customers are seeing about a dollar fifty increase in their, in their fees. So to them, it was a simple decision. So again, this isn't for everybody, but if your business, if you think that this is something that your business might be able to succeed with and save a ton of money, I think it's worth your time to hear us out and hear that, how, how that technology works. Um, I think, again, as more businesses get into it, all we need is one of the big chains, one of the big food chains to start doing it. Everybody's going to follow in line. But right now, this is for a lot of, um, we're seeing a lot of law firms, a lot of professional service type organizations, a lot of high average ticket, where, they're, where the average ticket is $30,000 or $40,000, um, their, their purchaser, the, the customer is willing to eat that fee uh, to work with that customer. So if this is something that might be worth your time, I'd love to talk to you about it, explain all the details, um, and it could really help you guys out. And I think that is, oh, and why not? Why not give us a shot? You trust us with your largest, largest expense as a business, with your payroll. Let us give a shot with your merchant services. Um, takes us a very short period of time to look at your statement and say, okay, yeah, we can help you out. We can save you a lot of money. Um, here's what we can do. And if, and if nothing else, if we can't help you out, you've got a trusted advisor that works with you. you, know, we, you know, we're happy to have you as a payroll company. We don't want to make you mad and try and do something we can't do. Um, we'll be the first ones to tell you we can't help you out. So if nothing else, you've got a trusted advisor who can say, yeah, we can save you a couple dollars a year. We can save you thousands of dollars a year. 
might be worth your time to give us a shot. So I encourage you guys, if you got a shot, to uh, reach out to me. I have some cards on the back table, um, or I'll be here all day long, and I'd uh, love to meet you all and talk to you about it. So thank you. And I think with that, I am now done. And we're going to do a five-minute break for a bathroom or, or uh, get some coffee or water. So thank you all for your time. Yeah, come on, clap. <laughs> Hi, I'm Frank Thomas. I'm the uh, Director of Benefits for Dominion Payroll. Been here for about two or three years now. Um, I interviewed uh, with the Davids and uh, explained my background about 20 years doing payroll administration. <laughs> Louder. About 20 years doing payroll uh, administration, then I moved into HR uh, benefits, did about 17 years of that, did a little bit of management consulting, worked for a couple of different service providers, and uh, talked to the Davids about, well, we want to expand our benefits. We've got this great application, and we want to make it available and surround it with professional services. And by the way, we have this thing with ACA that, this was in January, that we have to do within the next couple of weeks. Can you... Take that on. <laughs> so um, that was my introduction. And uh, um, yeah, as a result of it, um, we started um, our benefits uh, professional service organization that is um, really essentially a group of folks that I want to introduce. Where are they? Um, <laughs> first, we had, and we're going to come forward, um, Alex Johnson. Ashley Smart, oh, we're parading, <laughs> Josh Orange, and the elusive <laughs> Jonas Lampkin. And um, if you should call, um, which we encourage you to do, or email a uh, question regarding benefits, one of our team members, there are other team members who aren't here today, will um, <clears throat> respond to your questions, walk you through the process. So today's uh, seminar, um, we're going to cover a couple items, but um, we want you to call us. We want to uh, provide that hands-on personalized service that Dominion Payroll uh, provides. Um, having said that, client experience. So the first year with ACA was a little bit rough. Um, that was um, a learning experience for everybody. It was a learning experience for Dominion Payroll, our clients. It's actually a learning service for the IRS. Um, when we first started transmitting files, the IRS system was throwing back interesting in errors that were somewhat unintelligible. And, uh, but we got through that first year. Last year, I think, was greatly improved. And this year, we really want to have a, a wonderful client experience. <clears throat> so the few items that I'm going to cover, probably about 10 minutes, um, is what's new for ACA for 2017, the ACA reporting deadlines, how to audit data, review your data now in preparation, and I want to share a little bit about the shared responsibility that's coming up, and <clears throat> um, at the end of the presentation there's some links, things that I look at to try to keep up to date what's going on with ACA today. So the first thing I probably should ask is, how many of you are ALEs, applicable large employers, for purposes of ACA? Raise your hand. Okay, um, which means the rest of you, <laughs> this part of the presentation, you can kind of relax. Um, <laughs> so what's new? Um, if you are an ALE and you have to file a 1094C, uh, as of, um, October 10th, the IRS released the final updates for this year. And the changes for ACA for this year are minimal. So if you were expecting some big change or something new for compliance, the good news is <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that is not uh, going to impact you this year. There was, in the first year of ACA, a transition relief rule that allowed um, employers to avoid shared responsibility payments based on their size or uh, different size criteria. The transition relief rules expired. So as a result, the 1094 form 
highlighted here, that was a transition relief claim. You can no longer claim it. The IRS has kept it on the form as a reserved. So you'll see it there. It's not a typo. <clears throat> it's grayed out. Um, and, it, and the system will know not to check that box. <clears throat> the other change, and this again is a kind of a minimal change, on the employee instruction sheet, there is a <clears throat> paragraph, instructions for the recipient, and a, a link. In the presentation that we post, you'll be able to follow that link and see what that instruction, where that goes. But essentially what it's doing is telling the employee that they must now, when they do their 1040, line 61, last year they could leave that blank. This year, IRS is saying, <clears throat> nope, you have to fill in and you have to say you were covered all 12 months or no, you weren't covered all 12 months and then calculate what your shared responsibility payment is. <clears throat> so those of you who are tax-minded and understand <clears throat> the uh, 1040 filing, um, that's going to uh, potentially have employees coming to you say, I need that form, I need to know <clears throat> what months I was covered. And um, so, um, but that's a, a minor change to the 1095. I don't have a copy of the 1095. It's, kind of fine printed in the, in the data mailers uh, we have, but some employees will probably follow that and take them to that website page. I encourage you to follow the link, just familiarize yourself with that. Um, <clears throat> we have kind of a process, a dual uh, step process to bring our systems up to date. In October, the release we did this month, <clears throat> we did some of those updates so that you can start reviewing your forms. And then the final update for the system will be December 15th. After December 15th, <clears throat> we'll give you a notification communication. And at that point, you can approve your forms anytime up until our deadline. And I'll say it probably three or four times in the presentation what that deadline is. <clears throat> so, um, Last year, all employers are granted an extension to mark till February to give the employee forms out. So far this year, IRS is not granting that automatic extension. So <clears throat> as it stands today, the due date for the W-2s is now the same due date for the 1095 forms. So um, <clears throat> it's very important. <clears throat> uh, Penalties, obviously, if you don't uh, provide the employees the forms, similar to uh, W-2 penalties for not providing timely forms. <clears throat> a few of you who are out there don't use our ACA compliance services right now might wonder, well, why not? What's my criteria to determine that? We have, um, continuously, we look at our client base and look at the size of the clients and see if any of our clients are approaching the size where they need to comply. And the, the number is 50 full-time employees or full-time equivalents. So if you have a lot of part-time people, you aggregate all their hours up month by month by the year and it calculates. And if you have a lot of part-time people, you can bring you over that 50 full-time uh, limit. Um, there are some limitations in our ability to identify clients who may need to comply. One of those uh, limitations are if you have payrolls that we're not processing, we don't have visibility of those. If you're part of an aggregated group where you as an employer have common ownership over other businesses that you, um, uh, <clears throat> we may not have visibility to, those businesses have to be aggregated together in account to determine if you're over 50 employees. So um, that um, happened recently. We had um, a small company, eight employees, and they called us up and they said, we need to have ACA compliance. And go, well, you only have eight employees. They're part of an aggregated group with other businesses and their corporate office said, nope, you have to do this. So um, you, that could bring you into that uh, compliance criteria. The other is if you have benefit plans that are uh, self-insured um, and uh, any size employer who is, has a self-insured benefit plan, 
is essentially taking the place of the insurance company. And insurance companies have to issue a 1095B for coverage. If you're self-insured, as a, you have to issue that 1095B. So you could have 20 employees, and if you have a self-insured self plan, you would fall into the compliance where we need to help and produce the 1095s for you. Um, if you think you just crossed over and you didn't use ACA uh, services last year, contact us. We'd like you to contact us by December 1st so we have enough time to set up that service, test it out, and train you in terms of how it works. Um, we have received client calls um, this year from uh, a client um, basically said, we thought our broker was doing this the last three years, but they didn't. <laughs> Call us up <laughs> and we'll work with you to um, uh, get you set up and retroactively uh, uh, set up the uh, service. Um, so uh, when do we need you to approve the forms? The most important part of the presentation, January 5th, that will enable us over the next weeks after that to distribute the forms timely so you uh, receive them and can distribute them back to your employees. Um, there is, um, situations where maybe you have a uh, catastrophic something, your um, HR department leaves, benefits administrator, and you like, I can't keep up with this, I'm not gonna make that deadline, let us know. Um, we'll um, work with you if you feel that you're not gonna be able to meet that deadline. There is a form 8809 you can file with the IRS that gives you an extra 30 days. Um, if it truly is a major problem for your business, um, fire or something like that, um, the IRS will grant an additional 30-day extension. If you don't file timely for the employee forms, $260 per form that was not delivered on time, and another $260 if you don't electronically file on time. So it can add up quite a bit um, in terms of compliance. We have to complete the electronic filing by March 31st. So there's a little bit of a window where you got the forms, you distribute your employees, and oh, I got one employee here. We will probably have no problem doing that update, getting it into electronic filing, and you can either direct the employee to reprint a form or you can reprint a selected form um, as needed. So what can we do now, fun stuff? Audit, audit, audit. Um, <laughs> there's a few things that drive, the, the calculations for the form are automated within the system. It's deriv derived from certain employee codings. So the first employee codings is the employment categories. Make sure your employment categories are up to date. If you have people moving from part-time to full-time, um, those changes are the ones where you're gonna have problems with the forms. And if you see a form, it's not looking right, tracking back to the employee categories, is this historically correct? That will be the uh, first step. Second step is to verify that the employee's coverage, medical start stop dates is correct. Um, if you haven't maintained the coverage throughout the system through the year, and most of our clients have what we call pay items activated, which means the medical enrollment drives the payroll deduction. So you're up to date. But a few clients at the time we implemented didn't want that automation and may have fallen behind keeping the, the enrollments up to date. Those need to be updated before we produce the forms. And the third step is people who are hires, terms, rehires, those are uh, ones where you probably will have questions when you look at the form. This doesn't look right for the coverage, offers the coverage, and um, reviewing your employment status history is important. If you're self-insured, you're issuing information like an insurance company, and you have to do part two for all covered employees. That's uh, including their dependents. So um, if you have self-insured plans, you absolutely have to update the dependents in the system. Uh, that are covered. So there's a few things in I solved um, to assist um, this year. Um, going back to last year, the big release for us was 
um, a preview report. When we file the forms with the IRS, we get back a confirmation or errors. And some of the errors are um, things like the employee's name and social security number do not match, um, or social security number is missing, or address is missing, or address isn't formatted properly for, for the IRS. Um, we would have communicated those errors to you in many cases um, if it was an error where it did not accept the filing, we had to fix that error before we could uh, uh, transmit the data. To help prevent those last minute errors, we created a preview report that has some validation. It runs much quicker than the actual forms preview, and it will show you if you're missing an address. Social, it will validate if the social security number is bogus. One, two, three, four, five, six, nope, won't allow that. Um, and so um, that was created last year. This year, I think, is uh, something that Ken will get into some details with his presentation that follows, but there is now an option where employees can opt out of paper forms, including the 1095. And I think that's really pretty significant because you get the forms, you end up having to handle them, postmark them or distribute them. And if you have the employees opt out of them, um, as soon as you approve um, uh, the forms, you're pretty much done. <laughs> you don't have any other thing to, to worry about. When am I gonna get the forms? How do I get them out there and so forth? And um, the IRS was very specific about that opt out. Um, and there's a statement that had to be worded. It would be presented uh, to the employees. And once they agree to that, um, they can opt out of that. And can, again, Ken will give a little more details. Um, for some of our larger companies, um, the forms, the first uh, year or two, Development-wise, it had the employee address on the outside of the form, and that was it. Well, if you're a larger company, you want to actually distribute to different locations. Um, uh, there wasn't a really good way to do that unless you knew the employee name. Now, the uh, external side of the envelope will have information, the company code, the pay group, org values, and the employee number. So if you want to distribute the forms um, by department and so forth, you'll have that capability. Um, uh, which uh, should assist a little bit. So um, what have we done, Dominion Payroll, to prepare? Actually, ACA is almost a 12 month a year a process for us. We have an intern that um, has been working through and, and running uh, reports to identify clients who are um, ALE, um, ethical large employers. Um, part of the pro post processing, which we did around April, is sent back to you if you had a TIN error. Uh, that was um, an information, if, if you did not rectify that TIN error, it will com come up again this year. The IRS has very specific rules. You're supposed to do at least three contacts to that to resolve it. Obviously, if the employee's terminated, you may never get that rectified. And quite honestly, the filing, if the social security number is correct, the filing is going to be okay. The system that's used for this is brand new with the IRS and is validating names exactly against the Social Security Administration uh, database. So if there was a name change <clears throat> and it wasn't updated exactly the way the employee name change was with uh, the Social Security Administration, that's what's causing the TIN error. Um, <clears throat> The October release um, added some logic to validate if the dependent social security numbers are not valid or missing. Um, it also, um, when we file the forms, if we're sending dependent information, if it is blank, a newborn uh, situation, it now will, um, on the forms alternatively and in the transmissions, use the employee's, the dependent's birthday. Small thing, but it actually prevents a lot of uh, errors at the back end. Um, we will be communicating throughout the process through our Zendesk ticket. We have one ticket for each client, and we're gonna send out updates. You should have received a ticket that gave you the IRS instructions for 2017. It's pretty easy to do a Google search and find those instructions. As a courtesy, we wanted to get those to you 
that's the authoritative information of what am I supposed to do as an employer. So we encourage you to read those instructions. It's kind of eight pages of IRS stuff, but it's uh, real important stuff. Also this year, we've recorded three videos, um, very short videos, um, five, 10 minutes or so, to just kind of be a refresher, how to use the reports, how to approve um, the, uh, um, uh, the forms, and uh, um, encourage you, we'll be posting those on our website. And you for, forget this presentation, go back to those videos that will help you quite a bit. So there is a ACA checklist um, that is part of this presentation. Um, just things you can be doing uh, now. Um, there is um, the new training videos, and then in, in that communication ticket, we've uh, in, included a preparation guide, the checklist, your prior TIN, TIN errors, and uh, we're encouraging you to start reviewing your forms today. Main takeaways, deadline. Proof for it. Um, if you have a need, you don't have the ACA set up, contact us right away so we get started on that. January 5th, press the button, proof forms. Um, and uh, make sure you, when you receive the forms, distribute to the employees or postmark them by January 31st. Okay, so where is the button? <laughs> Client management, ACA setup, ACA forms approval, the button there, that's electronic signature. We keep that for our protection that you did approve the forms. If you approve the forms on time and then you realize, oh, there's something wrong, just give us a call. We can unapprove the forms. You can go in, make the correction, and then we ask you to reapprove the forms. Um, depending on where we are in the processing, we're going to start printing the forms after uh, the W-2s. W-2s will get the priority, and then after the W-2s are done, then we're gonna start the ACA forms printing. If we haven't printed the forms yet, there's nothing wasted. Um, if we have printed the forms and you fixed one employee, you can discard that form for that employee and um, do that correction, and then online you can reprint that form to give to the employee, or you could ask us to print it for you. Okay, so there's a lot of verbiage on this slide. I copied it not to read to you right now, but um, shared responsibility payments. So we did the filings in 2015, last year, 2016, and has anyone received a shared responsibility notice from the IRS? Nothing from the IRS. They've been real quiet about that. However, <laughs> um, on November 2nd, tucked away in a um, frequently asked questions site, questions 51 through 55, the IRS started to reveal what they're going to be doing. And what they're going to be doing starting in December, you will receive a 226J notice and basically will say you're subject to a shared responsibility payment. Um, if you've done the right things, offered affordable coverage, um, if we filed correctly, you may not receive this notice. If you do receive this notice, <clears throat> you have 30 days to come back with a response and saying you disagree with that assessment. And if you find in your review that, oh, you know, there was an error, we didn't, fill, we didn't send in correct information on uh, given employees, Give us a call, we can assist making that correction. Um, we're not entirely, nobody's entirely sure on the process in terms of what are these notices gonna give you to help as an employer to um, defend uh, your interests. The shared responsibility payments, there's schedules out there. It can be several thousands of dollars per employee. And uh, there are some websites saying that employers will see million dollar bills. I don't think that will happen to any of our clients, um, but it is something that is gonna be a concern. It's like, what do I do with this? Um, please alert if the, those notices go to a tax manager or somebody, uh, watch out for them. 
Um, if we start seeing them coming in for other clients, we'll send some communication on to you. Um, there is um, a small likelihood, I think, that clients are going to be penalized because in the 2015 year, there was a good faith effort of uh, protection. There were transition rules. Again, if you did the right thing, you um, should not uh, be fearful of that. One other uh, page. So the good faith effort did expire for the first two years. Um, it basically said that if you attempted to file forms and you made errors, you aren't going to be penalized. Um, there is an IRS Information Reporting Advisory Committee, IRPAC, and they make a recommendation. It's, an, it's part of the IRS. They make a recommendation um, wh whether there should be, um, uh, I don't, it's the best way to describe the recommendation. They, they're making a recommendation to extend the deadline for employers again for this year. So um, that recommendation um, was made the last two years and they did extend the deadline. It wasn't until late in the year. So. We may get an extra 30 days. We may not get an extra 30 days. Um, the other recommendation is to extend a good faith effort so that employers aren't getting that $260 per form penalty if they attempted to file information correctly and it wasn't correct. And then um, just recapping that form 8809, if you really think you need more time, um, there's an online site. We can't file that form for you for an extension because it requires the um, employer's registration for the IRS. Um, but if you do need extra time, uh, you have to file that form before the January 31st deadline. The one other um, thing that I think is going to be in the news um, somewhat is the individual form 1040 at line 61, um, the IRS has announced that they're not gonna accept that filing unless that's filled in. I think that um, potentially your employees are gonna be really interested in getting this form uh, timely. Uh, last year, you know, they don't have to attach a 1095 form. They, they're not supposed to attach a form with their filings, but they are gonna be required to fill in this line 61. So it's very important um, to be aware of uh, that because that's probably gonna come back to you saying, was well, I covered or not covered? Because they're trying to calculate if they didn't have coverage, what they have to uh, pay on their 1040. Um, electronically, it won't allow the forms to be filed. So tax preparers, employees will be learned. And um, if they send in paper forms and that line is blank, they were allowed to do that last year. This year, they're gonna be the, their filing is going to be thrown in that pile where it's, they're not going to get their refund. I include some uh, links. One of the ones I like, um, it's a private site, um, but their information is real good. The editor posts a daily article about ACA that's really not too technical, and uh, um, they, any changes in terms of delays and so forth, the ACA Times is uh, what I look at. Kaiser has some uh, real good sites um, that are uh, not, it's nonprofit, very good information about ACA. And SHRM is another great site. And then the IRS has multiple sites. Um, a couple of these, the instructions, um, shared responsibility payments, those are things I referred to as uh, on the earlier slides. So uh, these are available. If you find any that you think is helpful or is in conflict with anything we said, or doing, let us know and uh, we'll educate ourselves. And of course, um, send us requests. Like, uh, we really look forward to uh, supporting you through the process. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for those who aren't ACA compliant for listening um, and be thankful. <laughs> All right, I'll introduce Ken. Thank you, Frank. If everybody uh, didn't know, his last name is Thomas like the Big Hurt from the White Sox. So if you want to call him the Big Hurt, you have our permission. Uh, my name is Ken Fetzer, and we're almost done. This is the last presentation, and thank you guys so much for coming. Um, Andy and Kevin and Brad and Angie do a lot to put this 
seminar on and it's great to see such a big turnout and get to see the new building and everything. Um, the other thing, if you didn't know what Andy and Kevin were doing up here, um, they've been watching Netflix. Um, Stranger Things season two, like episode three, but no, they're, they're doing, for the Spanish television, they're translating it into that. Um, so they're doing a great job. So I'm um, awesome. Uh, very excited that we had some questions about paperless W-2s. We're going to mainly talk about that right now because um, we're super excited about it, and I hope you guys are too. And then we're going to take, take care of business with some regular year-end deadlines and stuff like that. Um, my name is Ken Fetzer, and if you want to meet the team, um, I'm Ken. It's definitely not Susan from the front desk. Uh, that's me at the holiday party. Um, we have our beautiful Alexis, uh, Diane the Witch, at Halloween, Halloween. And then the biggest carrot in the garden is uh, Nick Leto in the back there. But if you call or email and talk to the tax team, this is who you're going to talk to. Um, okay, real quick, some noticeable, notable statistics about what we've done last year. We paid out over $770 million in taxes to Uncle Sam, which is pretty astounding. It, um, it keeps growing every year, and we're going to get to a billion pretty soon. Um, the great thing is that 99 cents out of every dollar we pay electronically, which is the way to go. We're very happy about that. We now file taxes in all 50 states. We were just missing Alaska last year, so uh, Dave went out to grab just one client so we could do that. Um, and then our e-file return ratio is like the 941s and the unemployment reports. Uh, over 80% of those go electronically, which is fantastic. It's really just like the locals that are tough to, to get the e-file in, but keeping that high is great. Okay, so I've been here for almost eight years now, and this is the biggest thing that's ever happened. Um, there was that one day where we got an extra tray of cheesesteaks at lunch, but this, I think, takes the cake. Um, so the way it works, basically, is the IRS allows you or allows employees to say they don't need to get a paper W-2, right? Well, the, the hard part organizationally is, is you have to get every single employee to read a little thing and consent to it. Like, you can't just change your company and say, hey, we're all getting electronic W-2s now. Um, so we never really had the functionality to do this or the, the capability. Uh, our platform just rolled out actually yesterday so when employees log into their employee self-service portal, they get this message. You might have already seen it, and hopefully you've seen communication about it. But it basically says, electronic delivery of tax forms, I accept, I decline. And then it's got all the IRS lingo that's legally you have to do. So here is the message. Um, I actually, my wife is a client of ours, and I emailed her yesterday and I said, did you get that message just to make sure it worked? And she said, I accepted the message. It was pretty scary looking, but I accepted it. And so they don't make it very friendly because it goes right into the IRS lingo, but hopefully they'll see electronic delivery of tax forms and say, I agree. Um, so the big push and why we're getting the word out so aggressively is that if you want to have this happen for 2017, you have to get your employees to log into their portal. Basically, that's it. Because as soon as you log into the portal, that message pops up, and they're not allowed to proceed without clicking I accept or I decline. Um, real quick, does everybody, or who doesn't use uh, employee self-service? OK, Barbara, we'll talk later if you want. <laughs> but um, that's good that most, most everybody uses. So, Really, the mission that we see is getting the word out to the employees. Because like I said, unfortunately, we can't just flip a switch and all your employees get electronic W-2s. You've got to get the word out so they log in. Uh, OK, so the quick things that we might have some questions in your head. So like we said, each employee must consent. Terminated employees, as soon as you mark them as terminated, even if they've already accepted, as soon as they go terminated, they're automatically going to get a paper W-2, right? Inactive employees, on the other hand, are treated just like active employees, where they can opt out as well. Um, 
we have a Frank got the question. This also applies to the 1099s and 1095s. So when they click that one button, it's going to change all of them to electronic. Um, and then the great thing about this is that it's one and done. Once you click it this year, you are good for next year and for uh, future years. Okay, so most of the stuff, if not all the stuff that we're covering today is on our new website that Andy created for us. Um, the way to get to that is in your quick links, when you, when you log in, it's gonna say W2 alert exclamation point. That will take you right to the website. Uh, there's also going to be a banner on dominionpayroll.com, the homepage that'll be on the top. You can go to that. But basically, it just looks like this. Frequently asked questions, paperless year end forms, just so you can get a face to the name. Um, Andy chose the tree background, which, is, which was ad lib, and we all agreed that it was okay. So, like I said, the big mission we see, so I guess, let's take a poll real quick. Who is like, oh, this is kind of cool, it doesn't really affect me? Who is like, oh, I'm kind of excited, it's pretty cool? And who is like, that's not funny? Because the third option, who's like super excited about this? Fantastic, fantastic. That's, that's we're in that last category, so, so our, our mission is to have you guys get the word out to your employees because basically what we see is the big challenge is there's going to be employees that are either salary or just haven't logged in in a long time, never really checked their pay stub. And they're going to get to, it's going to be January and they're going to say, oh, I could have done this and, and it's too late by then. So really the goal is to get them to log into their self-service account. And we put this slide up because in the FAQ website, we put a little sample email where you can just copy and paste it into an email and send it out to everybody, prompting them to log in. Okay, I don't know if you can see this as well, but the other big piece of this is like I'm saying, employees that have locked themselves out or haven't logged in in 90 days and their account's disabled. If you go to this screen, client management, client utilities, and then self-service management. It's basically gonna show you the status of all your employees' ESS accounts. So it'll show you, hey, you've got 10 employees that are good to go. You've got 20 that haven't logged in in 90 days. You've got 10 that have tried their passwords too many times and they're locked out. And the great thing about this is these boxes, these boxes right here in between the view list, these boxes, if you have, for example, 10 employees that have locked themselves out, instead of going to each of those employees, you check this box and click on update accounts and it'll fix everybody. So if you have 20 employees that haven't logged in in three months, you check the one box, click update accounts, and then it's gonna send activation emails out to all 20 employees. So it makes it really easy to attack all your employees um, and the the X that we put here is basically when you get to this screen it's got one section for active and one section for terminated employees because terminated get paper w-2s you don't have to worry about them so that's just excess information uh, the question was how long when we send an activation email to the employees how long is it good for and the answer is 72 hours Three days. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for breaking from episode four. Okay, we had this question a little earlier. So, how do you know? So, let's say in three weeks or maybe a month, you've tried to get as many employees as possible and you want to figure out who are the bums that didn't log in and accept this. Well, right now, we, so December 1st, they're coming out with just a report. It's got a list of your employees. It's got their, the date that they consented. Um, and then so people that don't have that date are the ones you have, have to go after. So December 1st, you will have an easy report. They're building it right now and it's, it's gonna be fine. If for any reason you need one before then, 
basically, you can run the W-2s, your employer copies. It basically spits out where there's two W-2s to a page, and it's going to look like this. And I don't know if you can see, but the W-2 where somebody has already accepted has a watermark that says ESS copy only. So you can scroll down your W-2 list, and the ones that have the watermark have already taken care of business. The ones that don't are going to get a paper copy unless something happens. And so that report will be good for, you know, you can always use that. But there is one coming out on December 1st that's going to be, it'll just have like the list of your employees. It'll be a lot uh, shorter, more summary. What else do we have? Okay. The other thing is maybe the employee forgot what they chose or maybe they just clicked the button real quick, didn't read the message and like didn't care. Um, well, if you go... If you log into ESS and in the top left, you would click on your name, there's a new item here that says electronic delivery dash tax forms. Okay. Everybody has that now, except terminated employees. They don't have that. So let's say, so, so here's the options. If you originally clicked accept and now you click that button, it's just going to say, give you a message saying, Hey, you've already accepted to this. You're good to go. However, if the employee originally declined, because maybe they were too scared of what the message looked like and they just hit decline, but now they're like, oh, I want to actually do that, they click on it and it shows them the original message again. So they can then accept. So the other scenario, which is probably not going to happen, but what if an employee accepts and then for some reason they want to change their mind and they want a paper W-2? They actually cannot do that themselves. They have to contact you. I know, right? It sucks. And what you have to do is in the employee maintenance general screen, there's these new fields that says UN delivery consent date. That's the date that they consented. And then there's an, a field that says UN consent withdrawn date. So if they want to withdraw for whatever reason, you would have to put a date in there and it'll withdraw it, but they can't withdraw themselves. That's an IRS rule. Like that's what they decided they wanted to happen. I'm not sure, but hopefully we don't have too many of those scenarios. So that kind of stops the paperless W-2 section and I want to open it real quick to questions about paperless W-2 specifically. And you had a question? The question is, is there a deadline they have to make that option? The answer to that is the, you have, they have to accept before the last payroll of the year is processed. Okay? So if it's not the check date, it's the process date. So if you have a January, uh, December 28th check date, but you process it on the 25th, they've got to get it in before you hit the button. The question is, does the blurbage in the message talk about ACA forms as well as W-2s? Answer, fact. <laughs> so we, the communications that we sent out said W-2s just to make it easier for everybody because most of the people that affected our W-2s, we don't want to say UN tax forms every time because people are like, what is that? And so we just said W-2s in the communication, but everything in that message is whatever the IRS requires to have the 1099s, 1095s, and W-2s. So there's a lot of verbiage in there, and it does cover you legally to give them electronic 1095s, if that's kind of the question, sort of. Uh, any other questions about paperless? The best, the best way that we feel, and a lot of other uh, service bureaus are telling their clients, is we just made up a little sample email. So if you go to that website, um, you can bring up a sample email and then just copy and paste it and send it out to everybody. Yeah, we can't, we, we can only send mass things out to payroll administrators. We can't send, we can't send messages out to all the employees, although we'd like to. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and talk about still very important year-end deadlines and tax information and just as exciting. So yesterday, as we said, employees can begin to opt out of the payroll W-2s. 
Um, as Katie said, December 27th is the last day to process 2017 payrolls. For the employees that will be receiving paper W-2s, uh, we're gonna start sending those out on January 8th. And then we wanted the paper W-2 people and the electronic W-2 people to kind of get the, everything at the same time. So that Friday, we're gonna open up the W-2s for, for paperless. So one thing I didn't mention, for all your employees that accept this message, they're gonna get an email on January 12th. And it's just gonna say, your W-2s are ready for download. And it has a little link where they can go and retrieve the W-2s, 1099s, whatever. So that's January 12th. So if, if your employees are like, why am I getting my W-2s? Um, if they're electronic, January 12th, if they're paper, um, between the 8th and the 26th. So we're gonna start sending them out, go ahead. We're gonna wait, we're gonna wait till after the presentation because I think we're gonna open up questions to all the all the speakers. That's a frank question. Um, so January 31st, as you know, is the deadline to distribute your W-2s to your employees. So as long as you postmark it or hand it to them by then, you're good. Now the question is, what about if you have new employees that you're starting with you and you set them up, are they gonna get this message? And the answer is yes. So we're defaulting all new clients, new employees. So say you hire a new employee and you, and you give them, you get their email address and you send them the activation email. The first time they log in, the first thing they see is that message. And right off the bat, they can, Go green, forest background. So tax updates, social security wage base is going up to 128,700. Um, 401k contribution limits is going up $500 to 18,500. And simple IRA contribution limits is staying static at 12,500, I believe. That's correct. Social Security and Medicare, nothing's changing. Um, some, one thing to note, if you don't know, is the additional Medicare sometimes throws people off at the end of the year. If you have high earners, once people hit $200,000, um, they have to pay an additional 0.9% of Medicare. Um, I know you guys probably already hit that in June, so you're very familiar, but the employee portion of Medicare goes up and the employer portion doesn't. So some people are like, why are my employee and employer Medicare taxes different? And that's the reason. Uh, third party sick pay. The big thing here is to make sure that the insurance company is not issuing the W-2. Um, when you send third party sick pay wages to us, we put it on the W-2 automatically. Um, so if you do have third party sick pay, one good quick phone call or email to your insurance company, just making sure that they are not issuing the W-2 would be wise. Um, it just prevents double reporting. Go ahead. The question is if the employer pays for the premiums. Okay. Yeah, one thing to note is if the employee is paying for these third party sick pay premiums, like the employee, the employer doesn't cover, the employee's paying their premiums out of their paycheck, those wages are non-taxable because they're viewing that as that the, the employee already paid taxes on it. Um, and that means, yeah, that means you, you probably get a report and it'd be under the non-taxable benefit column or some kind of thing informing you that, hey, your employee paid the premiums on this insurance plan, they don't, they don't have to report any wages on the W-2. But that's a great question. I think I repeated it before. Uh, for large employees, we still have to do the ACA reporting. Thanks, Frank. Over 250 W-2s last year, you have to do the employee and employer health care premiums. Um, Again, this is information only. Um, it's so employees can see kind of the benefit they're getting that they don't see on their paycheck, you know. Um, 
and then some year end reports that you can run for the rest of the year that are uh, great to look over is the employee W 2 preview report, the verification report, the exceptions, and the year end exceptions. So all of these can be found right in the report archive. Um, so one, one thing I do want to note here is that if, if, if you're not running the exceptions report every payroll throughout the whole year, then I would advise that you start doing that. It catches a lot of little things that can be caught and fixed quickly until they manifest into prior quarter adjustments and stuff. So every time we have to run a payroll, during preview payroll, we click the exceptions report. Um, and I would suggest getting in the habit of doing that if you're not doing it already, because it's got a lot of things that can be caught and fixed before you run the payroll, um, in, including tax IDs, negative wages, variances, duplicate social security numbers, stuff like that. Uh, the employee W-2 preview report basically just shows you what the W-2s are going to look like. That's good to go over just to see if there's any blatant errors, like if you notice a social security number is all zeros or something, you know, these kind of things happen. So just scrolling through that. Um, verification, again, you're looking for most of the stuff the employee is gonna have to verify, but you can look over for obvious errors, stuff that, that you can kind of tighten up before we get into January. And then I think most people know, but when the quarterly reports come out, like the 941s and the state unemployment report and stuff like that, you can access those under reporting quarterly reports on demand and those stay out there forever. So if you have like an audit next year and they say, give me all your payroll for the last year and a half, you can just go here, click download file and has everything that they need for the most part. And I think, okay, so our tax email is tax at dominionpayroll.com. Um, and then I think we're going to open it up now to questions, not only about this presentation, about anything. Um, I don't think Ed's here to answer questions. He's probably surfing already. But does anybody have any questions about anything? Yes. Did you get the, do you have the year end tax form? Did you get one of those? Well, the question is, will we have the ACA checklist on the website? Andy says yes. Any more questions? Cool. We also have some uh, questions from webinar land here. So uh, let's see here. Uh, what is the deadline to submit 1099 information for 2017? December 27th. Right? That is the technical yes, we want you to be on time answer. The real answer for 2017, so the last day we can actually physically process it for 1099s, they are due to be reported to the IRS by the end of January. So you'd want to give yourself some time to both get the information to us, get it processed, look over the numbers. So we would say probably January 15th at the latest, just to give yourself a little bit of leeway. Um, segmenting off of that, Ken did mention January 12th as the day that W-2s are available in self-service. That means that if you're doing any 2017 adjustments, any of the fringe benefits I mentioned that you get from your account in January, if you have employees that are gonna have those and you don't have them done by January 12th, you need to let them know not to print off and file the W-2 that's in self-service. Something to keep in mind. Terrific. All right, uh, Heather Oxnam asked, uh, can you mention the COBRA piece of the 1095? Yeah, that, that's required for the self-insured employers. Uh, so unless you're self-insured, it doesn't apply. And if, if you have that, you are self-insured, and you have COBRA participants, contact us, and we'll show you how to do that. Terrific, thanks. All right, uh, Clay Ashby asked, uh, we have a lot of part-time employees, and uh, he, meaning Frank, had mentioned something about that could cause you to be considered ALE. How does that factor in? Uh, so that is an APCO large employer, Clay. So that is talking about whether you're required to do the ACA filing. So 50 full-time equivalent employees. So if you add up all the hours from your part-time people, 
divide by 30 hours a week. And if they qualify, say you have 100 people who all work 10 hours a week, you'll have about 30 full-time equivalent employees from your part-time staff. There's some great reporting in ISOL, so I would suggest for you, Clay, specifically to reach out to Frank and his team. They can help you run the reports. If you have all the information correctly entered in ISOL, so the employment categories and the hours, it's really easy. It spits out the number for you, and you don't have to do any of the math yourself. Okay, one more quick question. Uh, Jessica DeGraff asked, uh, will the W-2s uh, slash other tax forms that are sent to employees electronically be password protected like their pay stubs are? It is the exact same way they access their pay stubs, so the exact same password and the exact same security protocol. And another plug for paperless, if you're doing paperless W-2s, you probably don't need the paper vouchers that you're getting in your packages, so contact us and we can turn those off as well. Resident Hippie. Yeah. <laughs> the question is whether there is an app for the payroll login and for Time Force, and the answer is yes for employees. It's called iSolved Go. You do have to have it enabled on your setup. It usually runs in conjunction with iSolved Time, but it can be used to access their pay stubs. So in that case, if you're interested, contact customer service and we can get that set up for you. All right, uh, we have one more here. Uh, Francis uh, McDermott asks, did anyone mention anything about employer contributions to the health savings account? When does this need to be reported to DPS for inclusion on the W-2? The employer side of the HSA does go in box 12, code W, along with the employee portion, and that's due with the same deadlines, all the other fringe benefits, so December 27th, the Wednesday. If it, yeah. Mm -hmm. If that runs through payroll all year round, it's in the right code and you don't need to do anything about it. Okay, uh, we do have one more from uh, Paul Kanjorski. Along with W-2s, what were the other docs included if the employee elects paperless? 1099s are one, uh, are there others? It would just be the W-2, 1099, and 1095s. So all the year-end tax forms where you're filing your taxes with the IRS in April. Right. Any other non-year-end related questions? The question was about the electronic W-2 opt-in for the employees. So if you have 50 employees, 49 opt-in, but one declines, what happens is you'll get one W-2 in the mail. The other 49 will still all be paperless. All right. I think that wraps up questions. We've got plenty of Dominion Payroll employees around the room. If you've got something specific, year-end or not related, we're happy to help. We're generally carrying around our laptops and wearing name tags with one name on them. So feel free to ask questions or enjoy the rest of your day. Right. And for the people listening to the webinar, um, you can email us at customer service at dominionpayroll.com. This uh, webinar will be uh, available in full uh, in the next day along with the slides. So uh, sit tight for that. And uh, thanks for joining us today.